as I announced, as I wrote this morning, the kind of that end of the blackboard, we had a slight change in schedule. So as you probably noticed in the program, uh, each one of the invited speakers are, uh, is going to be giving uh, two talks. Right? And uh, today we're supposed to have Afonso giving two talks, but uh, we changed the program a bit. So instead of Afonso right now, we'll have Holger Rauhut from the uh, tech, uh, okay, RWTH. <laughs> And uh, Holger is a, a well-known name in the kind of mathematical side of compressed sensing. Uh, I know that um, at least a few people in this room have taken a look at his uh, at the book uh, under his name. And uh, he, well, I'm particularly interested in the, his results about that somehow relate to random matrices. As I said this morning, there are people invited because they're already friends, and there are other people invited because I, I've wanted them to, to come to here for some time, and he, he's in the second category. So, what would the further do? <laughs> so, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to lecture, but also to enjoy the city of Rio de Janeiro. Um, okay, so I will speak about compressive sensing. So I, I, I thought of splitting, well, I have two talks, and uh, so the first one I wanted to give an introduction to compressive sensing and give an overview uh, on the role of structured random matrices in this field, and in the second part I thought of going more to like uh, details uh, about the mathematics. Um, so, but I'm, I hope that I, I'm not boring people to death. So, um, if, uh, so who has heard about compressive sensing? I guess. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, 80%. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, yeah, please tell me if I can go faster. Uh, Okay, so, so the idea is that um, basically you want to do signal reconstruction if, if you have uh, too little data, at least at first sight. And uh, so in particular, if taking data or taking much data is, is very expensive. And this can, can arise in a couple of um, applications. Um, here is just uh, like three examples. One can imagine many more. So um, one popular example where compressive sensing is, is uh, very much investigated is magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so here, um, well, here is such a ma machine, and, and um, in order to get good quality image, uh, the patients have to lie in this machine for a rather long time. And so you would like to save time, and that sends also money by reducing uh, the time that the patient stays in this machine, and so this, in effect, reduces the number of measurements that you uh, take. Um, another application is, is uh, wireless communication. So um, here, uh, one instance, what you have to do, for instance, in wireless communication is to get an estimate of, of the transmit channel, and of course, you don't want to use, um, so what, what is often done is, is you send like, like some so-called pilot signals that both the sender and receiver know, and then from that knowledge of that, you, want, you get an estimate of what's going on in the channel, but of course you don't want to reserve all the capacity for these pilots because you also want to transmit uh, channels. So if you can estimate the channel with less information, that's, that's good for, for transmitting data. Um, and another application is uh, radar. Say uh, you want to get a high resolution image of, of a scene in the sky to see where the airplanes are, where the UFOs are. Um, I mean, this usually costs you a lot of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
uh, costs you a lot of um, uh, measurement time if you really want to get, get high resolution. And so compressed sensing is one way of, of uh, getting such, such images with, with uh, fewer measurements or potentially higher quality. Um, okay. Um, well, there's also a scenario that when there is too much data, and uh, so you want to get, get some information out of the data, and it's actually uh, too much, and I mean, to pro process all, all of this. And then, even then, um, it can be a good advice to actually first reduce the, the uh, amount of data that you have before you actually do analysis or even reduce it uh, at, the take, uh, at the stage of acquisition. And um, well, um, just some numbers. So the amount of generated data is, uh, well, people estimate it's growing by 58% every year. And like in 2010, it was this gigantic number. And that's even more than we can um, store or transmit. So. Um, well, one instance is this big uh, detector at, at CERN. Um, so the, the data that they produce is 320 terabyte per second. So you can imagine that's very hard to handle. And so you have to find out what's the important part in the data. And before they can actually do something, they need to delete the uninteresting part to derive at, at this still gigantic um, rate. And so, of course, it's the question how you decide what is interesting and what is not interesting. And another application is, is uh, like satellite imaging. And so this is one, uh, one instance um, where they really produced like this very high resolution camera by, by putting together like, like several hundreds of of uh, CCD chips, and but now the problem is that you have this data on your satellite, and you have to transmit it somehow to the Earth, and your transmission rate is is much lower than actually the, the rate at which you produce uh, data. So you somehow have to find a clever way to reduce that, and so one way of thinking about this maybe you can reduce the amount of data in the first place. So um, work with something where you have to take less data. And then, I mean, just try to find, find it in a way that in the end you just see the uh, relevant part. OK, so, um, so well, new is, is relative. I mean, the error is now out since 2004. But at least for those who are not familiar with it, it may be new. So um, the idea is, is to measure relevant information more directly and, and to reduce the amount of produced data but still enable extraction of information. And so one, well, one idea is, is to design then the sensor system and the corresponding signal processing methods at the si same time. So um, to, to, well, first do some, well, basically the mathematics to to decide which measurements are important and then design the, the sensor afterwards and not, I mean, usually it's done like, I mean, you design a sensor and then uh, you decide how to process that, that data. Um, and, and this leads to interesting mathematical questions. In particular, um, you, in the end, if you want to uh, analyze what's going on, you, you, um, you end up with, with techniques for random matrices, for instance. Um, and the other thing is you want computational methods which are effici efficient in order to produce these data. Okay, so that was just a very general introduction. And well, compressive sensing may be one approach to actually deal with, with this huge amount of data or the other scenario where you have actually too few data. And so the key ingredients are, I would say, three. Um, the first one is compressibility or sparsity. So the idea that the data you're interested in can be represented using only a uh, well, small number of, of uh, data. Like, um, like in a sparse representation, you have only a certain number of 
coefficients, which are actually non-zero, and you just need to store those. So the, the complexity of, of the relevant information is rather small compared to the ambient dimension. And um, the second ingredient are efficient algorithms, and often it's convex optimization. We have seen that in the talk uh, this morning, where this lasso problem uh, popped up. So, so L1 minimization is, is uh, one of the prominent tools. And the third ingredient is actually randomness. So if you, you think about how to design measurement schemes that, that are important in this context, um, if you want prov provable guarantee, uh, then, I mean, it's so far open to do that for deterministic constructions. And, and so you go, you pass to random matrices. Okay. So, um, yeah, sparsity, compressibility, why is that a u useful assumption? Um, so many types of signals can actually be represented by a sparse expansion, so with only few non-zero coefficients if you choose an appropriate basis. So this is the principle underlying JPEG, MPEG, MP3, and so on. But, but now what we want to do is not doing a compression, but we want to, want to use the fact that signals are compressible in order to reconstruct them uh, with only few measurements. Okay, so here's an example. So this is my son at the age of 10 days. And now we're sort of cruel. We apply a wavelet transform, um, which looks like that. And then we are even more cruel and delete some coefficients and reconstruct, and not much happened. Of course, you can say the fine details also matter if you are human, but um, anyway. Uh, so concerning the picture, um, uh, so we have 98% of these coefficients set to zero. Only the largest are retained. And if you, if you toggle back and forth, I mean, you don't see much of a difference. So it's approximate sparsity which is going on here. OK. And so here's an illustration of what compressive sensing can do now. So, so here's this sparse signal in 1D. So these are the Fourier coefficients of a signal. And only 10 of them are actually non-zero. And altogether, we have 300. And if we go to the time side, um, this looks like this. And now we take only 30 samples and try to reconstruct from that. And what, you, what we got is basically garbage. So if you, uh, you should compare this to this picture. And uh, well, obviously, it's not the same. And um, well, if you take just 30 samples, we have to solve an underdetermined system. Uh, basically, 30 times 300 system. And yeah, it's underdetermined. So um, you need to guess something, but now um, a compressive sensing method uh, gives you back this. Uh, so it's exactly what we started with. And uh, so this shows that this is really working. OK. So uh, that was the, the general introduction. And now to the mathematics. So what we want to do, we want to recover a vector um, from underdetermined linear measurements, so y equals ax. And uh, a is an m times n matrix with m significantly smaller than, than n. So, so we get an underdetermined system. And the question is, how do we guess the right solution to this? Um, and so the key finding of compressive sensing and generalizations is that recovery is possible if x belongs to a set of low complexity. And so there are several ways of, of uh, measuring low complexity. Um, one is uh, sparsity. This is what I just uh, explained and illustrated. So that's standard compressive sensing. So meaning only a small number of coefficients are non-zero. Then we can pass to a um, more recent model, which is low rank matrix recovery. So here, uh, we assume that we want to recover a matrix. And um, the assumption is that it's of low rank. So we replace sparsity by low rank. And then also things uh, can be proven. And, and in a special situation, um, well, 
in the so-called phase retrieval problem, we can also recover um, vectors when we only know the absolute value of of the um, of the uh, measurements. So I come to that later. And well, recently people tried to extend this also to recovery of low rank tensors, um, but the theory here is not very well understood yet. Anyway, okay. So, um, okay, so let's go to sparsity. So we have a coefficient vector and um, we only consider the S sparse vectors, meaning that at most S coefficients are non-zero. And um, well, usually you, you don't see exactly sparse vectors, but only those who can be approximated by a sparse one. So in image processing, I mean, in JPEG, I mean, you will not have exact sparsity, but at least you can approximate well by a sparse expansion. And in, in order to measure the error, we, we may introduce this quantity, sigma s of x measured in the Q norm. And um, we call then x compressible if this quantity decays quickly in s. And one particular instance uh, where this uh, this rate can be estimated is if you assume that uh, your vector x is in an LP ball with p less than 1, um, then this, this quantity decays like s to the 1 over q minus 1 over p. So in, pr um, in particular, if p is very small, that rate becomes very fast. So here, these LP balls with, with p close to 0 uh, uh, pop up naturally. Okay. And now the compressive sensing problem is to, is to well, what I just said, to solve the system when, when we have an S sparse vector and take M measurements. And the interesting case is, of course, that S is less than M because the difficulty here is to find the locations of the non zeros. So we don't assume anything on where the non zeros are, we just assume something on the number. And um, so even if we would. Uh, so, okay, if we would know a priori the locations, then of course we could reduce that system to a much smaller system. And then uh, if, if the number of measurements is smaller than the sparsity, then we could still not solve it. So, um, so that's a natural assumption. And in practice, we want a fast reconstruction algorithm. Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, has ever. Have everybody seen this already, or, or um, and also the things I, I discussed before? Uh, well, I, okay. Uh, okay. So, well, the uh, the Neve approach would be um, for, for reconstruction would be to solve this L0 minimization problem where you um, basically want a vector of, of smallest support consistent with the measurements, but unfortunately that's, that's NP hard, so it's not reasonable to do that. And now there are several alternatives, and the most prominent or best understood is probably L1 minimization, um, which consists in replacing this. Uh, this thing here, which is not really a norm, um, by something uh, convex. And so we get this one. And, um, and now we have efficient minimization methods available uh, because that's a convex optimization problem. And, but yeah, OK, there, there are several alternatives also, like greedy algorithms, like uh, orthogonal matching pursuit, and so on, iterative fata shoulding, iteratively reweighted least squares. Uh, for, I mean, some of the guarantees also hold for, for um, these algorithms that I will present, but, but this is the best understood, so we will stick to a one minimization. And, and the typical result now in compressed sensing is the problem, uh, is the following. Um, suppose this, this matrix A is, is chosen at random, like for instance from a Gaussian distribution and all the entries are independent. Uh, then we can recover an S sparse vector um, using L1 minimization with high probability from Y equals AX if the number of measurements gets linear in the sparsity up to this 
logarithmic factor. And so if, if the sparsity is very small, like much smaller than, than n, then we can do uh, undersampling because then m can be also chosen uh, smaller than the signal length n. And it turns out that this estimate is actually optimal, so clearly we cannot use less than s measurements, as I just explained, but also the, also the logarithmic term is in some sense optimal. And um, well, as I will explain later, um, we can have similar results for, for certain structured uh, random matrices as, as well. Um, okay, so, but before going there, let me also pass to low rank matrix recovery. So here, um, the goal is to recovery a, a matrix of low rank from linear measurements. So A is a linear map. Um, where now the number of measurements is less than the um, dimension of this matrix space. And well, the naive approach, again, would be to do this rank optimization. So you want to minimize the rank subject to the linear constraint. But again, this is NP-hard. Um, but now we can observe that the rank is actually the zero norm of the vector of singular values of x. and so. Um, having L1 minimization in mind, we, we just pass to the L1 norm of, of the matrix X, which is actually the nuclear norm. And then recovery of, of a rank R matrix from M sub Gaussian random, matri uh, random measurements is possible when the number of measurements scales linear in R times N1 plus N2. And of course, if the rank is small, then this is much smaller than n1 times n2. So um, again, we can do undersampling. Um, a particular instance that is quite famous is the matrix completion problem, where um, you, you got um, the information in a very particular way. Namely, you just see some entries of, of a low rank matrix. So here, for instance, you see these entries, but for the question marks, you don't know what the entries are. And then, again, you can run this. And under certain assumptions, you, you can, uh, again, get, get a guarantee like this. So you see the, the important part, or one of the important aspects of this theory is to get bounds for the number of measurements. Um, yeah. I already mentioned the phase retrieval problem. So here, uh, you actually get measurements of this form. So you take t have some measurement vectors a k, and you see the square of the absolute value of, of these. Um, so now you get actually nonlinear measurements. But um, you can actually reformulate this as linear measurements once you lift, lift the whole thing to a matrix space. So um, if you write out uh, this, this square, you can, can write it like, like that. And now you can put a trace in front. This is just a number. And then use cyclicity of the trace and put, put one of the x stars uh, to the back here. And now this is a linear measurement of x, x star. So, um, and now x, x star is also um, of rank 1 and positive semi-definite. So, so one idea is to use this uh, recovery um, approach. Um, so to minimize the nuclear norm subject to, to these linear measurements. And um, you can derive also um, results for that. OK. Um, so the question is now, how, how do you analyze um, uh, recovery using these um, well, for instance, the uh, convex optimization approaches. And so you need some conditions on, on the matrix to, to do that. Of course, this will not work for an arbitrary matrix. Just imagine you have a, like a submatrix of the identity matrix. Then if you look at, look at a vector which is uh, like sparse, so has mostly zeros, and then your measurement process just sees some entries, then you mostly see zeros, but you don't observe the entry uh, trees, the non-zero entries that, well, that are non-zero. 
or some of them, and then there's no hope of actually getting the, the value of this. So, so there has to be some conditions on the matrix. And, um, okay, and often um, uh, these conditions, can, or it's hard to check them for deterministic constructions, so we pass to random matrices, and then um, there are actually two types of results. Um, one type of result is a uniform result, which, which says that, okay, we pick this matrix at random, but then once we picked it with high probability, every sparse vector or low rank matrix, matrix et cetera, can be recovered with high probability. And the second one, uh, ah, okay, and then um, we need some conditions, some deterministic conditions on A that actually allow us to make such a statement, and uh, well, one is the, the so-called NAS-based property and the other one is the restricted isometry property that you have probably uh, already seen. Um, and then the second um, type of statement is non-uniform, which means that we, we first fix the vector to be recovered, then draw the matrix at random and ask uh, for the probability that, that with a random draw we can recover that fixed vector. So. Um, so we get a statement of that type. Of course, um, uniform recovery implies non-uniform recovery, but not the other way around. So sometimes it's useful to, to, to actually just prove statements like, like that because it's easier or you get slightly better conditions. And um, one, one uh, condition actually to, to check that, um, works with so-called tangent cones of, of the norm at x um, while intersecting the kernel um, or so-called dual certificates which basically come from duality for convex programming. Okay, so let us first look at, at um, uh, this, this recovery condition via tangent cones. So we look, look at an optimization problem where we minimize this norm uh, subject to this linear constraint. And now the tangent cone or descent cone um, of this norm at x is the conic hull of, of these vectors, z minus x, where the norm of z is less or equal to x. Uh, I, I will draw a picture in a second. And now the theorem is, is uh, very simple, uh, we can recover x by this optimization problem um, if the kernel intersects tri trivially with, with that cone. And actually that's, that's an if and only f condition. So uh, let me just illustrate this. So you have um, like, like for the L1 norm, so let's say here's your, your point and then Let's say here's the L1 norm, and then um, I mean these are the, the, the directions in which the norm is decreased, and so so the 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 tangent cone would be actually well the one where you shift this thing to the origin. And now um, you want to do recovery. So let's say um, so let's say this is the this is x plus the kernel of a, and so um, all these vectors here uh, will give you the same measurement because if you add a vector in the kernel, you will not change the, the measurement, and so. Um, so if you do the minimization, you try to find, find the vector of, of smallest norm on, uh, on this hyperplane here. And if, if we have a situation like this, that um, all the descent direction, I mean, okay, so, so here would be the kernel of A. So the kernel of A intersects this, this cone just in, the, uh, in zero. And then um, this means if you, if you move along here, 
you just make the norm larger because you're not, not going inside this cone. And if you have the other situation that um, the, kern the kernel actually uh, looks like this, then actually uh, if you move along here, then you make the norm smaller and then you actually cannot recover by the minimization problem because, because the, the minimizer will be some, somewhere else and not, not here. So, so that's how you can understand this, this condition. And now the good thing is that, that this can be analyzed um, rather easily using Gaussian random matrices. Um, so Gaussian matrix, again, um, you have independent standard random variables as their entries. And you can analyze the recovery using the so-called Gaussian widths. So for, for some set uh, in Rn and for a Gaussian standard vector, uh, you introduce this quantity here. Um, so you take your uh, vector x in the set, take the inner product with this Gaussian vector, the supremum, and then uh, the expectation. And um, then you can, can show that um, we can recover a vector x from y equals ax using that minimization problem with high probability if the number of measurement scales um, is larger or equal to the um, Gaussian widths of this cone, t the descent cone at x intersected with the sphere. And um, yeah, this is based on Gordon's uh, theorem, Gordon's escape through a mesh. And uh, is, is, well, I would say um, it's, it's rather simple and, and uh, nice to analyze. Um, the thing is, um, so, so this is, you can understand this roughly as, as a dimension, or, or the square of this you can understand as a dimension of, of the sets or, or the complexity. And for instance, you can estimate this if, if you have the s sparse vectors as your set t then, um, well, or rather the descent cone uh, of the L1 norm at an S sparse vector, then, then you basically get this condition here. And here the, the twiddle uh, says, I mean, it's not a constant involved. It's basically the, this up to terms of lower order. So, so you even get the constants very nicely. And I think Joel will, will talk about this uh, much more on, on Friday and how to get how you get this uh, much more precisely. Um, OK, so that was the, the, this condition based on tangent cones. Um, if you want uniform recovery, um, um, a useful property is a so-called NAR space property. And that gives actually necessary and sufficient condition for exact recovery of all S sparse vectors via L1 minimization with a matrix A. So now, uh, once you have this, you can recover all vectors uh, using a single choice of the random matrix. And um, OK, so the condition says the following. You pick, pick a vector in the kernel and a support set of um, cardinality S, and then you ask that uh, a vector in the kernel restricted to that support set um, and, um, well, measured in the L1 norm is less or equal to constant rho being less than 1 times the um, vector restricted to the complement of, of, uh, um, of this set. Um, we have actually seen this, or a, a very similar condition uh, this morning uh, in the analysis of, of Lasso. Um, so what, what does it say? Um, OK, it basically says that all the vectors in the kernel are somewhat flat. So, so you cannot concentrate the large entries on, on a few, um, on a few um, components. So if, if uh, because if, uh, if you would take then um, these components as S, then you will not have, have this uh, satisfied. And this is somewhat natural. I mean, imagine the, the extreme case that you get a sparse vector in, in, in the kernel. 
then um, if you apply your matrix to that vector, you get zero, and so you cannot distinguish that vector from the from the zero vector, and and so this makes it this a little <coughs> this idea a little bit more quantitative, and then you can use that for analyzing L1 minimization, and. Um, it also gets you, I mean, using this constant uh, stability of reconstruction. So as I said, usually you will not meet exactly sparse vectors, so only those who are approximately sparse, and then the error of reconstruction um, between x and the, the reconstructed vector uh, will be bounded like, like this. So this is the error that you make by assuming that x was actually sparse, and you just get this constant in front. And you can also have a version for matrix recovery. And um, yeah, sometimes it's not completely straightforward to show this null space property directly. And, and therefore, people came up with the notion of restricted isometry property. Um, so you introduce this constant delta s um, as the smallest one, such that you have this um, chain of inequality satisfied, valid for all s sparse x. So on the set that you're interested in, you require that the matrix is well conditioned. And um, OK. So uh, in some sense, this requires that all s column submatrices of, of this matrix A are well conditioned. You, you see this if you take a vector of a certain uh, of sparsity s and restrict that vector to the support, then it's uh, applying. I mean, the application of A to that means you restrict A to that support set and apply it to the restriction. And then it's basically um, meaning that this restriction is, is well conditioned. So since there are quite many uh, sub-matrices, this is a quite strong condition. Um, but OK, uh, well, just a remark, you have also matrix variant uh, for, for I mean, linear maps go on, on matrices. Um, but just to tell you that there is an extension of this. Um, so once, once you have that delta 2 is, is less than this, this constant here, 1 over square root of 2, I mean, the, const, the value itself is not so important. But anyway, then, then L1 minimization reconstructs every s sparse vector from y equals ax. And moreover, um, you also have a stability under noise. So if you actually start with noisy data and not necessarily a sparse vector, and you consider this optimization problem where you build in like this residual, um, and so you, this is natural if you, if you know that the two norm of the noise is, is at most sigma, then the error of reconstruction is bounded by two terms. One is the error of best estimate approximation in L1 divided by square root of s. And the other one is a constant times the no noise level. And uh, a similar estimate you get for the L1 norm, I mean, for the error in the L1 norm. OK, so, um, so this means that this, re this restricted isometry property is, is very nice if you, if you want to analyze sparse recovery and even in the realistic scenario where you have noise and not exactly sparse vectors. But the question is now, um, which matrices do satisfy this? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, it's an open problem to, to provide explicit constructions uh, of such matrices. And um, the goal is actually to have, like, this delta s small if uh, m scales linear in s. So you can actually have such con construction if you allow a quadratic scaling. Um, but uh, well, of course, that's much worse than this linear scaling. So um, so you can have these constructions, but but I mean they're highly suboptimal. And by, by the way, it doesn't mean that, that these constructions do not satisfy something like that. It's just hard to show anything like that. So it's unknown whether these constructions actually have a better scaling. But um, I guess this is very hard. I mean, there, there is a slight improvement. Um, Bourguin and co-workers produced something which has a 2 minus epsilon here. 
but there is works by Dustin Mixon who estimated epsilon to what was the latest number, 10 to the minus 12 or something. So it's, yeah, for practical purposes, it's still two. Um, so the way out is random matrices. And so the standard um, um, choice of random matrix is the Gaussian or Bernoulli matrices where you have independent entries and say uh, standard normal distributed or, or uh, Bernoulli plus minus one distributed, and then um, you, you get the scaling. So if M scaled linear in S up to this log factor, then, uh, then you get the restricted isometry property of, of this rescaled matrix. And um, as a consequence, you get recovery of sparse vectors um, with high probability under this scaling, and, and this is actually optimal. So you cannot get rid of, of the logarithmic factor. Um, and you can have something similar for, for uh, the matrix version for, for low rank matrix recovery. Okay, so um, in the title of my talk, it was like a structured random matrices. So, so um, why should we consider something like, like that? So um, the problem with, the, with these Gaussian matrices is that for, for real applications, um, it's actually hard to imagine that a real physical process can be modeled by, by this, this Gaussian uh, random matrix, in particular that all the entries are independent. And um, so you only ha usually only have limited freedom to inject some randomness. Uh, I will give you examples. And the second um, reason why you want structure is that um, you want to use these, these matrices in these recovery algorithms. And then uh, you usually would like to have a fast matrix multiply, um, like, for instance, exploiting the fast Fourier transform. And otherwise, it's completely um, impractical to, I mean, to use, use these Gaussian matrices if you really have a problem where the dimensions get, uh, get a bit larger. Then, then you cannot really uh, do that in practice. Okay, so um, I will t give you some examples where, where structured matrices pop up, and the first one is random sampling. So here, um, the simplest setup is, is to consider a trigonometric polynomial, and um, say in d dimensions, but you can think of d equals one for simplicity, and you assume that, I mean, this index set that you allow is of cardinality n. And you say f is s sparse if this coefficient vector is s sparse. So in practice, that, that appears, um, may appear uh, a lot if, if, like in electrical engineering applications where you have a signal which consists uh, not of, well, where not all the frequencies are really present, so, so but you may not know which frequencies are, are present for this particular signal. Um, and now the, the idea is, uh, or the task is to reconstruct f from, from sample values. So you pick some points, and then you have the values at these points, and you want to reconstruct. And um, if you introduce this non-request space Fourier matrix, then the um, sequence of samples um, can be written as y equals AX, simply, uh, I mean, plugging in here these points TL, these, these are here, so uh, you get this uh, structured matrix out of it. And now, um, as I said, we need some randomness to analyze this, otherwise it will be very hard. So we choose now the sampling points independently and uniformly at random from, from the cube. Then A becomes a structured random matrix I mean, the, the randomness comes from choosing these points at random, and the structure, of course, is given by this formula. So in particular, you have much less independence in the entries of the matrix than for a Gaussian matrix. So for a Gaussian matrix, all the entries are independent, but here um, only the rows are independent. But if you, if you go through the entries in one row, they are, uh, I mean, they, they depend more or less deterministically on each other. Okay, and then the question is, uh, can we get recovery guarantees for this type of matrix? And um, 
you can. And so the first result um, here is the restricted isometry property, which then implies um, uniform recovery using L1 minimization. And the condition that, that we get is that M should scale um, linear in S um, up to these logarithmic factors. So compared to the Gaussian case, you have here four log factors instead of just one. Um, it's presently not clear uh, whether you can do an improvement, although who told me, Joel, I think, that Bourguin removed one of the log, log factors. Uh, you said that? Well, okay, I've, but I haven't seen it, so um, um, yeah. I mean, the conjecture is that you can remove all these log factors. Yeah, okay, but if you, if you, yes, yeah, I, I've seen that, but um, it's not, it's a different matrix then, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so, you, so um, using that result, we can rec do a recovery with, with that number of samples, so if you, if you ignore these log factors, again, we have linear scaling. Um, well, we can actually get, get rid of the logarithmic factors if we do non-uniform recovery. So here we fix um, the vector to be recovered first and then draw the matrix or these points at random and, and re try to recover that particular vector. And then uh, results result can be shown that now has this logarithmic, well, the linear scaling in S and only one logarithmic factor. So now this builds actually, the proof builds a dual certificate and derives some bounds by using certain combinatorial estimates. So, so you uh, look at higher moments of certain quantities and then, um, then well, well re-express this by, by certain, um, certain sums, uh, so multiple sums, and then you just have to see which, which terms are zero and one, and this leads to combinatorial arguments. There is another idea which has become quite popular. Um, it's called so-called golfing scheme using uh, by, by David Gross. Um, and the idea is to, to I mean, to construct a certain dual vector by iteratively and uh, okay, and this leads to, to a similar guarantee. Okay, so um, I already showed you an example, but here's another one. Um, so a sparse trigonometric polynomial with sparsity six and uh, well, we, we assumed that the maximal degree is 40 and took 25 uh, random sampling points, uh, so these are these circles here, and, and if you do a reconstruction by one minimization, we get, get back exactly this, this curve. And uh, so this is a more uh, realistic scenario. Here is an MRI uh, image, and so this is uh, done using um, a traditional method. And here, we, uh, compressive sensing is, is used. And, and so um, here only, um, uh, well, the downsampling is by a factor of 7.2. So that's, or that's the acceleration. And, um, and the advantage is, I mean, if you ask doctors that, I mean, of course, the visual quality here is much better. But also, some details here are, are visible that are not visible in this picture. OK. Uh, there are some extensions. So you don't necessarily need to work with trigonometric system. You can go to what is called a bounded orthonormal system. With some trick, we can also use orthogonal polynomials, spherical harmonics, and uh, functions of, of many variables. And then if you do this cleverly, we can avoid the so-called curse of dimension. And uh, one can also do something using weighted L1 minimization, which then takes also some sort of smoothness into account by using suitable weights. 
Okay, so that was random sampling. Um, the next um, type of structured random matrix I would like to consider as subsampled random convolutions. So here um, we consider the cyclic convolution of, of a vector B with the vector X. So that's the definition if you haven't seen it before. And um, well, okay, so if we start with a vector of length n, we, we get back again a vector of length n. So in order to do compressive sensing, we, we sort of reduce the number of, of measurements we take. So we do some subsampling. So we consider only the, the samples in some set theta of cardinality m. And one choice may be just the first m entries of the result of the convolution. And now we want to do um, to recover a sparse or compressible vector from these subsampled convolutions. And um, as I said, we need some randomness. So now we choose the generator, so this vector B, um, as a sub Gaussian random vector. So, um, well, meaning that the entries are independent, mean zero, variance one, and sub Gaussian, which means that the tail behaves like this. And well, to be concrete, um, you could choose a Rademacher or a Gaussian vector, for instance. And so the question is, how does this uh, thing behave in terms of compressed sensing? Um, well, you can de um, describe the corresponding matrix, which is a so-called partial random circulant matrix. So it has these entries. And um, and now if we do a subsampling, we just we do not have the full matrix, but just like this rectangular part. So, I mean, uh, and in the end, it looks something like this. So the, the entries of the matrix are constants on, on these, these diagonals. And the good thing is also that we have a fast matrix vector multiplication using the FFT, simply exploiting that the convolution uh, can be <coughs> diagonalized using the Fourier transform. And one can also do this in 2D, look at triplets matrices, which correspond to non-cyclic convolution, et cetera. OK, um, where does this pop up? So one application is radar. So here, um, this, this uh, radar station sends out a pulse. And um, if there are some objects flying around, um, then this is uh, backscattered, and the, the station records the echo. And now, um, since these objects may have different distances, and uh, the speed of light is finite, um, the, the, the recorded echo um, arrives at different uh, times. And so, so what the, the, the station um, records is actually a superposition of delayed versions of this sense signal. And, and this is actually a, a, a convolution of the so-called um, well, distance profile. So this is a vector which has like the reflection coefficient at, at an entry corresponding to a certain distance if there is some airplane. Um, and you would like to um, well, get information on this, this uh, distance profile. And if you want to use a cheap hardware, I mean, you want to do some subsampling. Or the other way around, if you actually uh, have your hardware, but you want to increase the resolution, then, then you may, may also uh, view this as a subsampling. OK, so this is one application. And the other one comes from imaging, so um, so-called compressive coded, ap coded aperture imaging. So um, I mean, usually. OK, so a very simple model of a camera is this pinhole camera. Um, we just have a hole here. And then here on, on, the, on the CCD chip, you just get, get an image of, of the scenery. But now what you can do is actually, instead of just one hole, put, put several holes here. And, and this is called a coded aperture. And then what you get at the CCD chip is um, basically a convolution of the so-called point spread function of this um, aperture uh, with the scene. And so um, we get a deconvolution problem. And um, the idea is if you can do subsampling, um, 
so this means that we, we record with a CCD chip this image at a certain resolution. The idea is that you can then increase the resolution if you, if you uh, can solve this, this subsampling problem. And okay, so these were two, two applications. Um, then some numerical experiments here. Um, we fixed the signal length to 500, the number of sampling points to 100, and varied the sparsity, and this is uh, the, the recovery rates that we got. So, um, so one means that we always got recovery, and here we got never recovery. And if you compare this with the curve that you get for Gaussian, it's basically the, the same. So this means that um, this actually works, and the question is why? And, and so here's um, finally the, the estimate for the restricted uh, isometry property. Um, okay, so, so we've, we choose this generator as a sub-Gaussian random vector and, and look at the uh, set of sampli well, sampling points of cardinality m. So this is deterministic, so uh, can be just the first m uh, entries. And now if the number of samples scales linear in the sparsity up to this logarithmic uh, factors, then with high probability we have the restricted isometry constants of this rescaled matrix small and we can do recovery while one minimization. And um, the interesting part is that the analysis used new bounds for so-called chaos processes, so we really had to develop this new tool for, for this um, uh, for this type of matrix. So um, there were some, some previous bounds, like uh, by these people, where there's still a quadratic scaling in the sparsity. Then with Joel and Justin Romberg, um, we thought about this for quite some while, I think, um, and got S to the 3 half, which looked a little bit funny. and. Um, but we didn't see a way to get better and then finally published this. And then with, with Felix Kramer and Shao Mendelssohn, we actually found a different way to analyze this. So, so this is, was based on, on some, some general bound for chaos processes due to Michel Talagrand, and, and so we had to do something. Um, well, in, in a special case, we improve on, on his um, so I, I thought actually to, uh, for the second lecture to present details on, on this. Okay, so um, you can also do something for random sets. Um, this was done much earlier uh, with the linear scaling, but what it, what's important for us to have it actually for deterministic sets because then you can treat certain applications in electrical engineering where it's hard to do this for random sampling. Like for instance, think of this imaging application where you have the CCD chip, so, so this is very, very regular subsampling. And there was a previous result um, for the non-uniform recovery where I also got the scaling in, in S. Um, okay. Um, this is another type of matrix, maybe a this is coming from time frequency analysis and can be analyzed also in the same way as the um, partial random circulant matrices. And well, I prepared another application in radar, but um, I think I'm already running out of time. So I'm okay. It's just um, so. Um, so the idea is you have some some antennas on some aperture and you try to image a scene. And now the randomness comes from putting these antennas at random positions. And then the matrix you get out of this is, um, yeah, it's, it's of the entries are of this structure. And um, so these RJs come from this grid and the AKs are random. So uh, with here with, like with M, uh, or let's say with N antennas, you get, we get N square measurements, so, so this, here in this matrix, not even the rows are independent anymore. So, so we, uh, from from n, um, well, random numbers, we we got um, an n squared times capital N matrix, and we need to analyze that. So, 
But for that, actually, the, the RIP is still open, and we only get a non-uniform result. Just to show you, I mean, this is the original scene, and here's the re reconstruction, and uh, this apparently works. Um, OK, and here's the theorem for that. Um, just um, in general, I mean, uh, the techniques for, or what do you have to do to actually get estimates? Here is, is usually what you have to do is to bound a stochastic process um, in a certain way. Usually it's the supremum over some, some set T, or sometimes it's an infimum that you have to bound. And there are several choices of these sets popping up, and of course, several choices of, of these. Uh, stochastic processes, but that's what it usually boils down to, what you have to do. And um, so if you have structured uh, random matrices, like in this Fourier case, you usually get empirical processes. And the, the other, um, um, like this partial random circulant matrices there, we get so-called chaos processes. And my idea was to, to lecture on this, unless you want to see something else. I still have like three days to prepare, so, um, <laughs> so. okay, so I, I, I will, will talk about the details uh, on this chaos process and uh, how to get this bound. Okay, and if you want to learn more about compressive sensing, you can look at this book. So thanks for your attention.